Um, every marketplace business has two sides, buyers and sellers. Sellers bring the supply or the inventory uh, that's for sale in the marketplace, and buyers bring the demand, and transactions happen in between. And this can be applied across many different verticals, many different categories. For eBay, that was products in the early days. Uh, for Airbnb, that's spaces where travelers and hosts uh, come together. And for Eventbrite, that's events in the middle. But this can be applied, again, in many, many different verticals. Um, so one thing that's unique about marketplaces is, at scale, they are incredibly valuable. Uh, if you look at some of the all-time most valuable internet businesses, like literally of the internet era, some of the most valuable names on there, Amazon, Alibaba, Uber, eBay, et cetera, are multi, multi-billion dollar companies, and there's a reason for that. We're going to walk through a few of those today. So starting with why are they so valuable, uh, first and foremost, they've achieved marketplace liquidity. Uh, so liquidity is defined by Simon Rothman, who's a marketplace expert at Greylock, uh, the venture capital firm. He's one of the founding GMs at eBay. He founded uh, eBay Motors. He says, liquidity is the reasonable expectation of selling something you list or finding something you're looking for. And that may sound really, really simple, but when you think about all the different permutations of what people could be looking for, what price they're willing to pay, et cetera, it's really hard to make those matches and make them on a consistent basis. Sure. All right. Let's try that. Is that okay? All right. Cool. Um, so liquidity matters in that it drives cross-side network effects. So cross-side network effects happen when uh, the addition of more buyers to a marketplace makes it actually more attractive for the other side of the marketplace, the sellers. So if you think about it, if there's a marketplace and there are more buyers on the platform, more sellers want to be there because they want more eyeballs to get their goods in front of. Um, on the other side, it works both ways. It's reciprocal. Uh, as there are more sellers on a platform, there are typically more products, more varied, uh, more competition for better quality, more competition on the price side. Um, and then so they want to join, or more buyers want to come to the network. So really, again, cross-side network effects are when the strength of one side has effects on the growth of the other. And... Uh, this is really not an overstatement. Network effects can really create virtually impenetrable barriers to competitive entry. And the two main factors that drive that are they drive increasingly attractive economics. So your cost of customer acquisition goes down uh, while revenue per customer goes up. So it costs you less as network effects start spinning to acquire the next customer. And you can extract more value from those customers because you're providing more value, you're driving incremental sales, and you can start to increase your take rate over time. The other thing that it drives is retention. So when there are true network effects in a marketplace, um, oftentimes sellers can't even leave the platform because it becomes such a big part of their uh, sales that if they were to leave, they would lose 10, 20, 30% of their sales. So they have to stay. They have to participate in the marketplace. And so uh, one of my favorite network effects experts, James Courier of NFX Guild, said... Um, he wrote a blog post called the Epif An Epiphany on, Market, uh, on Network Effects, and he said, the only feature that mattered was everyone was there. Whoever gets the network effect first wins. And he was talking about his time at Monster, the job marketplace. Uh, he talked about how poor a user experience it was, how mismanaged of a company it was, but that it had reached scale, and all of the uh, you know, people posting jobs felt they had to be there, and all of the people seeking jobs felt they had to be there. So, dude, let's start a marketplace, right? Like, who doesn't want to be these two people sitting out, hanging out on a pile of money? Uh, but before we do that, I think it's important to acknowledge uh, startups are hard, but marketplace startups are incredibly hard, incredibly, incredibly difficult. And I'll go into a few reasons why that's the case. But uh, first, I'll start with some history. So in the first 10 years of the Internet era of handful of large horizontal marketplaces achieved scale. So think eBay, Amazon, and Craigslist. Uh, most of those companies that achieved scale, the marketplaces, they've survived. So again, remember the network effects and the power that that has in building enduring businesses. And so some of those are thriving, but others have actually ceded share to vertical marketplaces. Um, this was a popular blog post that went around probably six, seven, eight years ago, and it showed, this is uh, Craigslist's homepage, and it showed how many different vertical businesses have sprung up. They've picked basically a link or a category on Craigslist's homepage 
and built literally billion dollars, multi-billion dollar businesses. Um, so it's not to say that um, these large marketplaces are, are totally um, impenetrable. Um, they can be chipped away over time, and that's what we see happening today. Um, this is a, uh, an outlook of the marketplace category, uh, you know, all marketplace categories. This is maintained by Bessemer Venture Partners. They've stated that there are over 500 private marketplaces today. So not only are there mature marketplaces that have network effects going, there are a ton of players out there trying to build vertical marketplaces. And so I think one thing that'll be interesting to talk about is some of my observations on why have some marketplace gained traction, reached network effects, while others haven't. And starting with finding that next great marketplace idea. Uh, the first tip is don't go head on with the giants. It's just not worth it. Um, it's too difficult. This was a blog post that was published last week by, or last month by M.G. Siegler. He's a partner at Google Ventures, uh, former writer for TechCrunch. He was talking about social networks in this post, but I think it's very applicable to marketplaces as well. And he basically argues that we've reached saturation of large networks. So you're very unlikely to find the next Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, et cetera. They are just at scale, and there's not enough time for humans to spend more time on social networks. Uh, but the same teachings apply for marketplaces, and, and they can be um, interjected here. So marketplaces have hit network effects. Uh, the big ones are there to stay, and the game is over. And so the key takeaway that I think applies is there's no more room for horizontal marketplaces. You have to go niche, building marketplaces around targeted passions or needs. Uh, but the question, there's always an exception, right? Always. Um, so... What about that startup that has hit scale uh, in, a ver in a horizontal approach? And I think the, the reason that can happen is at times there are technology and platform shifts that sometimes open a window to attack these horizontal marketplaces that are slow uh, to adopt that shift. Um, if we think about Craigslist, like this might be a little bit harsh, but anyone who's used Craigslist mobile, uh, it's not a great experience today. Uh, and it opens the window for competitors like OfferUp, uh, $1.2 billion valuation. Um, if you had asked me three years ago, can anyone take on Craigslist head on? I would have said no. But I think Craigslist probably missed the jump to mobile. Um, OfferUp is mobile first, mobile only. And they have found a way to force the supply and the demand side. And they're seeing those network effects start to kick. But way, way, way before network effects, uh, I want to share a few tips on how to think about getting a marketplace going. Uh, so the classic question in marketplace is you have the buyers, you have the sellers, supply and demand. Uh, where do you start? And it's a constant chicken or the egg problem. Uh, and I'll make it simple. I have a definitive answer. I think this holds almost all the time. Start with the supply. Um, so in the long run, most marketplaces tend to be demand constrained, meaning they need more buyers. Um, but in the beginning, you have to start with the supply. One of the key reasons is if you drive demand before you have supply, it's like sending people into a store with bare shelves. They will literally churn out. Uh, first impressions matter immensely. If somebody comes to a marketplace that's crickets and there's no activity, they'll never come back. Uh, so when thinking about picking a market, uh, I have a little bit of advice for how you should think about picking your target supply. Um, starting with, I would seek out inefficient, fragmented markets that you can work to roll up. Um, that doesn't sound like great advice, right? That sounds pretty terrible, but um, it, it's an important one. So Bill Gurley, a uh, pretty famous venture capitalist, said, look for high fragmentation and high friction for supply sign-up. Um, so if you see a target market and it looks like the supply is easy to get, there's a database online that you can purchase, there's some other simple means to get it, that should be a red flag. Um, an example here is Zillow and Trulia in their marketplaces in the real estate space. Very fragmented space. You had no single source of real estate listings data at the time. They had to go out brokerage by brokerage, crawl the web, find creative ways to build that supply, um, engage the agents, which were very fragmented across many different brokerages. It was a very long, painful slog for that business. I know SC worked at Trulia, so I'm sure she has some war stories. Um, and it's also typically a much more nuanced B2B style acquisition approach. So it's not Facebook's get every user on the planet. It's getting targeted, more small business or business style customers um, as opposed to that you know, more consumer model. 
Um, so next, I'll go over some strategies and tactics for how to think about growing your supply base. And I'll start with one of my favorites. Uh, I call it the Trojan horse strategy. Um, it's kind of a backdoor for building a marketplace, and it's far less malicious than it looks. It's not about raiding your customer base and pillaging them, them from the inside, but more uh, thinking about first building a product that serves your target supply customer's needs that can be used without having to have the demand side yet. So an example here is uh, Thumbtack, the local services marketplace. They built tools for their service providers that they would onboard onto the platform to post their services to Craigslist in a much more easy, more elegant, more beautiful way. They also built tools for their service providers to manage their business better, and that gave them a path to engage a lot of the supply before they were driving enough demand for it to be meaningful for those customers. Um, another important aspect is this can help you bootstrap the marketplace. So if this is a product that you can charge for, you can effectively reduce your burn while you're working towards that end goal of marketplace uh, and helps to offset some of the costs of building it out. Uh, Eventbrite did this. This was a core model. So when I joined Eventbrite um, a little over four years ago, it was very much a SaaS platform for event organizers. But over the last four years has shifted to a more marketplace model, trying to drive demand. Uh, but again, it could have been a standalone billion-dollar business just as a ticketing SaaS platform. But it is evolving over time to build that demand side. Uh, this is an example from my own startup that I co-founded uh, in 2010. Um, we tried a novel approach. So we uh, crawled the web, mostly classified listings. We worked to clean the data and structure it. And then we distributed it to Amazon Web Services, Mechanical Turk. This was in the early days of Mechanical Turk, to actually build structured business listings for service providers that didn't have any online presence. They weren't on Yelp. They were just posting to Craigslist. They didn't exist. And what we did is then emailed them and said, hey, we've started this business profile on your behalf. Claim it here. You can augment it, create your own business website. Um, or they would actually we'd publish it to the web, and they'd Google themselves and find their listing and claim it that way. So sometimes I think the point is you have to get creative and think about different ways to aggregate that supply. Uh, that said, Thumbtack, which I would argue is a much more successful example, they were in the same space. Um, they also crawled the web, but they built a team of 300 people in the Philippines, um, much less structured, technology-driven approach, but they would have their team in the Philippines email these service providers, invite them to join the platform, um, and I would say their approach won. It worked better than ours did at scale, uh, which is very uh, much against what I would have thought at the time. Uh, and I think the point is uh, many different ways can, can work. It's just what works for your business. Um, another classic example, many of you have probably seen this. This is Airbnb's tool that they built to allow uh, people on their platform to post their listings into Craigslist's ecosystem. Um, and what it does is it not only drives demand, but it also gets your product in front of other service providers or supply that's in those liquid networks evaluating what are my competitors doing. They're, they're observing what's happening. And this is basically demonstration virality, which is when the nature of a product's usage is such that simply by using it, people are showing it off. Um, so it's another great approach. Um, and another, another example, this is pretty atypical, but it worked for TaskRabbit. So key takeaway is timing and a story that people want to hear can go a long way. So TaskRabbit was founded in 2008, pretty much the depths of the, the financial crisis. People were out of work. They were seeking more ways to provide for their families. Um, and TaskRabbit told the story of we are going to enable people to make extra money on the side and help to put America back to work. And that was adopted far and wide. The press coverage that TaskRabbit got was insane. And so it unlocked the whole supply side. The company had waiting lists in every city around the country of thousands and thousands of people that wanted to join to get these jobs. And it literally negated the need for any other supply acquisition. It's just incredible. Um, so, again, that wouldn't have worked for every company, but it's seeing an opportunity and leaning into what works for you. So, again, many ways to do it. You have to find the right way for you, and so much of it is timing. So what meets your target market's needs right now? And so then moving beyond that startup stage, if things start working, uh, what else should you consider to help scale the business? Um, so one thought is marketplaces that start horizontal can drive growth and defensibility by building vertical solutions over time. 
What I mean by that is eBay started as a very horizontal platform, but they were seeking their, their first core use case. And that actually was collectibles. I was sort of during the Beanie Babies craze. Um, you can see this Beanie Baby is for sale, $400,000. But they found their niche. They found their first use case. And what that enabled is they would see sparks of what was working on the platform. And then they would uh, build a cross-functional team with a GM dedicated to a category. In the next screenshot, it's eBay Motors. And they would build, they would adapt the platform to that specific category. They would have category-specific marketing. They would build a uh, you know, supply and demand density in that category and then go to the next one, and then to the next one. And so where we saw the screenshot earlier of Craigslist being picked off by different uh, competitors, if you take this approach, it can help prevent some of that from happening, tailoring the use case uh, to specific categories on the platform. And here are a few other examples. So I mentioned Thumbtack before. Uh, on one side of the screen, this is their process for asking for a dog walker. You can see it's super specific. They have 1,100 service categories on their site, but they've tailored it very specifically to dog walking. If you look at Eventbrite, uh, very broad horizontal platform, started very much in this networking meetup groups tech space, but we're doubling down in categories like music here where we've built dedicated product solutions for that category, dedicated go to market, and we will continue to replicate that across different verticals. So what's the risk in not verticalizing? Like why, why should we care? Again, this is what happens when you don't do it. And if you go back to TaskRabbit circa 2011, very broad platform. You could have any task done, any job done you needed. And this did two things. One, it created the paradox of choice for consumers. They thought it was a great idea, but they'd come to the site and say, what do I do? What, what's the core application? And fast forwarding to now, you'll see these are the current valuations of several of these companies, multiple Billion dollar companies have been built in categories that TaskRabbit first started. So, uh, huge learning for me in retrospect. Uh, today, fast forward to today, TaskRabbit has focused on far fewer categories. The use cases are very core to what they can fulfill uh, with high consistency, high quality, um, and uh, it's, it seems to be working for them. Another key insight that I've learned over the years is it's important to track satisfaction and NPS for both the supply side of your marketplace and the demand. You can't just have an overall marketplace NPS. You have to know what it is on both sides. And the reason that's important is because you can actually borrow NPS from one side of the marketplace to help the other side. And typically, you want to shift. Say you have, uh, you know, your supply is more satisfied with your service than the demand. You want to find ways to make things better for the demand side. And often in marketplaces, what you do that benefits one side is at the expense of the other. So you're basically redirecting goodwill from one side to the other. And I'll give the TaskRabbit story there. So the business model started as a lightly managed bidded marketplace. You could post your task. The TaskRabbits would make offers. You'd pay when it's done. Uh, as a consumer, you'd set your willingness to pay for the job that you're trying to get done. And then the TaskRabbits could browse jobs in their area uh, and bid on what they liked or, or choose not to for things they didn't want to do. Uh, on the supply side, the taskers loved it. Super, super high NPS scores, like high 80s, really, really high. Uh, and they were thrilled. They had flexibility. They could make money that when they want, they could choose the jobs that they wanted to do. But the detriment came on the consumer side. So there was high consumer NPS on the demand side when there was a match made, right? Like when the supply would bid on a job, but that match rate was under 100%. And if you posted a job to be done and didn't have it fulfilled, you'd never see that consumer again. Again, bad first experience, they were gone forever. Um, and so in a marketplace that was more demand constrained, right? I talked about how there, were so, there was so much supply, but we needed more demand. That's an unhealthy balance of the two sides. Um, so we worked to fix that. Um, so we saw this as a problem. Uh, I wasn't here to see this through, but I helped to write the initial operating plan for how we would shift from this bidded model to uh, a model with no bidding, much more of an on-demand, managed marketplaces, tighter focus on fewer categories. And the result, uh, one, the supply side, again, the taskers were furious. Like these were literally, that's at crunch headline, venture beat headline, it was just chaos. Like, I've never worked at a company that's had like their company logo in flames on the homepage of TaskRabbit, right? That's how bad it was. 
And I was standing on the sidelines like, oh, my God, what had they done? Uh, but it ended up absolutely being the right move. It was a painful move, but it was the right move. So the business model worked better. Growth accelerated for the company, shifted the surplus goodwill from the supply side, the tasker side, to the demand side. It solved the consumer pain points around the matching, speed, and the quality of the jobs being fulfilled. And from all the insider um, you know, sound bites I've gotten, it seems like growth has reaccelerated in the business very well. Um, this is another uh, interesting insight that I've gleaned over the years. So getting your customers, which is typically the supply side, to promote your brand can be worth more than any marketing here. To bring that to life, uh, it's appropriate that we're at Yelp today, but I'm sure you've all seen those stickers. Uh, you've seen the task rabbits running around San Francisco, their branded shirts, the Instacart bags, the Uber badges, et cetera. These are real-world examples, but there are ways to incentivize and or require your supply side to promote your brand. Um, I think what's an even more powerful model at times is if you can find a way to build that into how your service works and or get people to evangelize online. Here's an example of a uh, Eventbrite organizer with the embedded Eventbrite ch uh, checkout process on their site. So they are effectively driving demand, driving customers to transact through the Eventbrite platform off of the platform. And we as a company get all the great branding from it. Huge. And you can also see OpenTable done the same with online reservation. Um, vanity is a great means to get that done as well. So on the bottom, you'll see these best of, of Thumbtack awards. So Thumbtack picks their top 5 10% of service providers. They give them a badge and say, hey, you're one of our best pros. Put this on your website. And uh, they're very willing to do it, and it drives great exposure for them. Um, another insight is to look for overlap between your buyers and sellers. So some of the best marketplace models that I've seen have overlap between the two. So typically it's buyers shifting into sellers. And where this becomes so powerful, it's a very, very powerful dynamic. And this is the one that exists for Eventbrite. Eventbrite will acquire event organizers who host events on the platform. They then recruit attendees to attend their event. And Eventbrite drives more attendees to their events on their behalf. Some percentage of those people who attend events on Eventbrite first learn of the service. It's an awareness tool. It's virality. And then some portion of those people convert into event organizers. And so the cycle keeps spinning. And we found ways to experiment over time to increase that rate of understanding and increase that rate of conversion. And at the scale now where Eventbrite has 50 million plus active ticket buyers each year, even small percentage increases in that conversion rate drive very, very meaningful supply acquisition. And we aren't the only business with that dynamic. Etsy, Kickstarter, GoFundMe. Here's an example of Airbnb where people first learn about the service by traveling and booking a room and then later decide to list their space on the site. So this is an experiment from probably four or five years ago of them trying to drive that. So to wrap it up and bring it all home, uh, marketplaces aren't necessarily winner-take-all but they generally are winner take most. And that's driven by the network effects dynamic. So winning is network effects kicking in. And really, at the end of the day, liquidity is the only thing that matters. The first one there wins. So <coughs> everything is focused on driving that liquidity, the matching, and uh, hopefully some of these tactics have been helpful in helping you think about how to do something. Thank you. We're going to take questions. If you don't mind, just repeat the question before Will you do. answer it. Great. Thanks. Questions? Yes. Yeah. So um, liquidity is, oh, sorry. The question is, uh, I finished with liquidity is the only thing that matters. Can I expand on that and how I think about that? Is that right? And exactly what liquidity means. So. Liquidity is uh, the reasonable expectation that if you as a seller post something to a given marketplace, that there's a reasonable expectation that that item will sell. Uh, same thing if you're a buyer. If you are a buyer going to a marketplace trying to purchase something, you have a reasonable expectation of finding that item at an appropriate price and being willing to purchase it. So 